Hello everyone, um, as promised this is going to be my video on my belief in God, but to begin with I'd like to apologize to anyone who thought that I may have been blowing them off in um, private messages or otherwise. It, it simply takes way too long to respond to everybody individually about this, this giant subject that often goes back and forth in debate, and I simply don't have the time for it. So again, apologies to anybody um, who thought that. I simply feel that this video is the best way of, of having that discussion. Um, I would also like to mention that I don't really like discussing religion, politics, or, or things like that, so I'm doing this video for you guys. I, I simply, I don't, I find it boring. It, it's, we've gotten nowhere in the past millennia based on discussing, based on discussing it, and it's everybody's favorite topic. So I would much rather spend my time debating things based on empirical evidence like science, for example, um, or evolution. So, again, um, understand that I'm doing this video for you guys. The Lastly, I'd want to ask that, that those of you watching this video be cognizant and be aware and be careful not to show the same intolerance and narrow-mindedness that you guys absolutely hate in the fundamentalists. Because keep in mind, it's the measure of, of true intelligence to be able to entertain an idea while not accepting it. All that I ask is that you guys entertain this idea. To start, I'd like to um, make a distinction between belief and knowledge. Most people think that they're completely separate things, but I, I actually would like to comment that they're extremely closely related. Um, nothing is e ever 100%, and most of you guys know that. I don't really have an argument with you guys there. But what's the difference between belief and knowledge, I ask? <coughs> Excuse me. Most people would simply say, well, knowledge, if, if you know something, well, it simply has a higher probability of being true. But I would ask what that percentage is. Does it have to be 99% true before it goes from belief to knowledge? before you know something versus believing it? What about 99.5? What about 80? And on what do you do you assign that cutoff value, bet cutoff value between belief and knowledge? I mean, it, it's pretty much arbitrary, isn't it? So while most people think that they're completely the same thing, or that they're completely different, I would argue that they're not necessarily the same thing, but they're very, very closely related, and that's something to entertain and keep in mind. Now going on to, to evidence for God. Um, there are things which are true which can be said, and then there are things which are true which cannot be said. This is one of the latter. Um, there, there are many things that cannot be tested empirically. Does that mean that it's wrong? No. And a belief in God is exactly one of those things. The nature of God is something which, by very definition, cannot be tested empirically. So, so are things like whether or not you love someone or your personality. Those things can't be measured empirically. And if we were to take a, a scientific approach to whether or not person A loves person B and apply the, the null hypothesis of they're not in love, there's no empirical evidence to gather, no data. So the null hypothesis, there's no evidence to overturn it. Therefore, the conclusion would be, based if it was a simply you know, scientific analysis, that the person doesn't love the other person. And that's the wrong way to go about it, and it can lead to a false, re false result. You have to, science is a tool. And like everything else, each tool has its limitations, and each tool has its applications. So using t science, which by definition deals only with um, natural phenomenon, to disprove a, or prove rather, a god, which by definition is a supernatural event or phenomenon, and therefore by definition outside the realm of science, is going to be like using a hammer to attempt to you know, unscrew something. It's, it, it is a valuable tool, but again, you have to know where to use it. And that's important. And that's also why someone can be not compartmentalizing or, or not necessarily comp keeping things completely separate. It, it's simply you're selecting the right tool for the right job. <coughs> Another reason why I personally believe in God is due to personal experiences, which leads to the discussion about subjective versus objective evidence. For example, hypothetically, if I saw Jesus appear to me last Tuesday and bring me a milkshake, I would be a fool not to take that into account when, I, when I'm evaluating whether or not Jesus really exists. On the other hand, it wouldn't do very much for you, which is why it's subjective evidence. And subjective evidence is exactly what can make um, one person's view of something rational while another person perhaps not. Um, and that's personally one of my reasons for believing in God. The second thing would be, and I know many of you guys will scoff at this, the, the supernatural. Um, I believe in things like ghosts like that. I believe that it is much more likely that just one, and wait, make no mistake, I believe that 99% of, you know, all ghost encounters and things like that, quote-unquote miracles, are, are absolutely garbage. They didn't happen. But I simply believe that it is much more likely that just one, just one of the billions of independent encounters, encounters of ghosts and things like that since the beginning of recorded history 
it's more likely that just one of them is accurate than that they're all wrong. And keep in mind, the existence of a ghost or any form of life after death would be indicative of a soul, something which natural selection can't really explain and can't account for, and that would necessitate a supreme being. So again, if I were to apply the, the null hypothesis of there being no God, all those things that we just talked about, if I take them into account, I believe that it is more likely that there is a God um, than there's not. And I think that that's enough evidence, subjective, objective, or otherwise, to overrule the null hypothesis that there's not. That, in addition to the fact that the very nature of God should be exempt from it, or not exempt, but it is a limitation of the scientific method. So that's important to understand, too. And it, it's, you have to really take that into account. <coughs> now on to evolution, and why Christianity and evolution are not in conflict. Well, the Pentateuch has four authors. There's the Yahwist, the, the Eloist, the um, Deuteronomist, and the Priestly author. And the, the, the Pentateuch and the Old Testament was not written by Moses. Um, these four authors, they're not known by name or anything like that. They're just identified because they have distinct writing patterns and they lived at distinct times. Um, for example, the Yahwist had a very... Um, very personal view of God. And you can see this in the first creation account where he's, um, you know, physically molding um, Adam out of mud and things like that. That simply doesn't happen and isn't seen in the other um, creation accounts. You know, it's also evidenced when God is walking somewhere through the desert and things like that. The the other um, author of the other creation account, that is the Yellowist, had a, had a more removed, although still personal view of God. This is evidenced by him, you know, God's Whenever he's writing, God's not really touching things. He's more of a divine thing. Um, he simply speaks, and, and man is made. And the Eloists lived about 850 BC. Um, so again, this all testifies to Genesis being best taken allegorically. Um, another thing is that something can be allegorically true without being literally true. And I think that original sin in one of those things is an example of that. Um, original sin is still a useful allegory because it explains... A, to simple minds and, and to primitive people, why, we can, why we're still here, an example that will suffice until science can come around. Because keep in mind, most primitive minds can't accept or could not accept, you know, dissent with modification, and most primitive minds still can't. Um, the second thing that it does is it, is it prefaces our need and explains our need. One, um, I don't want to use the word to be saved, but... It explains our, I don't want to use the word sinful either, but to use our, our, to explain our sinful nature, to explain the things that, to explain the fact that human beings do horrible things to each other, um, and, and bad things in general, objectively bad things, and as a result, um, we need to pay for those things, and be forgiven and be saved. So I think that um, Genesis allegorically, and original sin allegorically, can explain that perfectly well. Um, the message isn't lost. It's simply the fact that the vehicle chosen to portray it, to portray the real message, is allegorical. Is allegorical. And as far as um, Adam and Eve and things like that go, I don't believe in Adam and Eve um, as literal people, although it could simply say, or you could simply say, and this is what the Catholic Church believes, that um, the difference at some point in human evolution, God gave souls to man, and, and that's what makes us human. And the first people that God gave souls to would be Adam and Eve. Now, uh, this also raises an important question in the sense of, well, what part of Genesis or what part of the Bible is allegorical versus what part is literal? Why, why aren't they both? Um, or or why, why, how do you know that the resurrection isn't allegorical then? And there are a couple of things for that, but it all stems from you, you having to understand the historical context of the documents at the time. Um, it, it really is an in-depth study that, that you really do have to spend your whole life devoted to, just as, you know, you can study science and things like that st the, to properly interpret data and things like that. Studying these texts is equally important and takes an equal, if not greater, amount of time to um, determine whether or not, the, what the best interpretation are. But there are a couple things that you can do and, and understand basically without a huge education in something like that. To begin with, any education whatsoever will demonstrate to you that literalism is wrong. All you have to do is take a look at Cain. Who did he marry? Women of the land is what the Bible says. Well, there should be no other human beings around. So, again, who did he marry? Did he marry his sisters? Well, that'd be incest. So, of course, literalism is completely wrong. It removes all room for intellect, among other things. Um, I'll continue this in the second part of this video. Thanks, guys.